Hey there, welcome to the third section of our unit on energetics. Uh, here we're going to focus on the process of cell respiration. We just got through talking about photosynthesis. Now we get in to cell respiration, which is where we take what we made from photosynthesis, take that stored energy and go through the process of releasing it so that it is a usable form of energy for cells. So let's do a little bit of the basics first. Um, and that's kind of what this was going to focus on, is a little bit of the basics plus some anaerobic respiration. The idea behind it um, is to break down organic molecules to form ATP. So you remember that ATP is our body's dollar bills, right? Um, so the whole idea is we take this $50 bill and we need to go through the process of exchanging it for a stack of 50 singles and you know that's just the best analogy to talk about how we um, take an organic molecule and break it down. So aerobic respiration um, is a process that is absolutely 100% oxygen dependent and this is what's going to be the difference between aerobic versus anaerobic. So um, it's oxygen dependency. This process, the whole process of releasing this energy from an organic molecule begins in the cytoplasm of the cell. And the process first starts with, um, well, in aerobic, there's three steps, okay? Um, there's glycolysis, there's the Krebs cycle, and then there's the electron transport chain. These three steps are vital to building up that cache of ATP that we need to. The first step, glycolysis, happens in the cytoplasm. So remembering our breakdown of our words, lysis to break, glyco refers to your organic molecule. So like, you know, you have like glycogen, glucose, um, the breakdown of this initial molecule. Um, so the first step. And then the process moves from the cytoplasm into an organelle. I wanna see if you know which one. So which organelle? was the important organelle for cell respiration. I think you know? Starts with an M. So the mighty mitochondria is where we're going next. Oxygen actually doesn't play its role in this process until the very end. It is the final electron um, and hydrogen ion acceptor. Okay, so just like with it's it's funny, photosynthesis is very much a reversal on most of this process. Oxygen is one of the first things to be released in photosynthesis. In cell respiration, it's the last thing used or the last reactant that's used, um, and it sits there and it's just ready to grab electrons in the electron transport system. But we'll get to that. And what the electron transport system ultimately does is sets up a gradient, a huge gradient of hydrogen ions and electrons to basically go through the process of building ATP and phosphorylating it, right? So we've got that ATP, remember our cycle. You've got ADP, we phosphorylate it with a phosphate, and we make ATP. Want to use the ATP? Fine. Pop off a phosphate and we get ADP and it constantly goes around. So that phosphorylation here, the addition of the phosphate to the ADP molecule is what is the ultimate piece that's gonna happen during the electron transport system. All right, so here's an overview, okay? Um, this is something that we're gonna come back to a lot. This is a pretty important little diagram because it actually shows the breakdown of the entire process of, aer of aerobic respiration. Don't stress about it now, we're gonna break it down piece by piece, but just to give you a sense of the overview, again, glycolysis, note that it's occurring here in the cytoplasm. This is where we're gonna take my glucose molecule, okay, C6H12O6, we're gonna break it down, okay, into pyruvate. Now here's the thing, we're gonna break it down into two pyruvate molecules because this is a six carbon atom, pyruvate is a three carbon atom. Okay, and we're gonna bust it up into two of these and we're gonna send it along. Um, so ultimately what's happening is the Krebs cycle is really happening two times because we have two pyruvates entering into the Krebs cycle. Now before we actually get from here into here, there is what we call the prep step that we're gonna mention 
and talk about in class. And once the pyruvate molecules enter into the Krebs cycle, we are going to um, build up and use, actually, a bunch of cofactors known as, and this is where it might get confusing, so don't confuse it with the NADPH of photosynthesis, but it does ultimately the same thing, um, where it's going to be a donator for electrons. Uh, we're going to make NADH and FADH2, our two sets of cofactors, and we're going to basically grab their electrons. So those are going to be oxidized in the Krebs cycle so that, um, and basically go, th you know, basically get them ready so that they can donate their electrons to the electron transport system here, bounce their electrons through so that the oxygen can pick up these electrons, pick up the additional hydrogen ions that are flowing through the ATP synthase, and we make water, which is one of the products spit out at the end. Here's my other product spit out at the end carbon dioxide, and we spit those out during the Krebs cycle, ultimately to build up this huge, huge store of ATP. Okay? So again, little overview, nothing to like get crazy about yet, because we will be breaking this down piece by piece, okay? and even talking about the net yields and everything. So um, we'll be filling in all of these blanks over the course of the next little bit. All right, so I want to just finish up this vodcast today by talking about anaerobic um, ATP formation. So this really involves glycolysis because we're going to use um, and build a little bit of ATP during the process of glycolysis and this being anaerobic, this is no O2 involved, okay, no oxygen necessary. Um, and the process of fermentation happens here. Uh, this is something that our prokaryotes do to get their energy um, because they don't have any mitochondria, so they can't really use oxygen to build up huge stores. Plus, they're single-celled. They don't need that amount of energy. So fermentation, we're going to look at this in the lab, too, utilizes this first stage of respiration, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic, this process of glycolysis. What we do in glycolysis is we're going to produce cofactors NADH. We're actually going to produce a little bit of ATP, okay, so a little bit, and regenerate the NAD pluses. All right, let's see what this looks like, okay. Now, alcohol fermentation, um, which again, is the only process we're going to go through to create this energy. This is something that yeast cells are capable of going through, bacteria can go through. This is where your end byproduct is ethanol, um, which is why they call it alcohol fermentation. So glycolysis still happens. Here's my glucose molecule. Again, just like photosynthesis, we're going to follow the carbons, okay? We're going to break apart, okay, this molecule into two pyruvate molecules, okay? To do that, I am going to need to utilize two, and I'm sorry that the words are over that, two ATP molecules are going to be used, okay, in order to help break apart this glucose molecule into two pyruvates, three carbon, six carbon molecules. In doing so, all right, I'm going to reduce this cofactor NAD, NAD plus into NADH, and it's going to be two of them, okay? When I do this too, I actually will phosphorylate four ATP molecules, okay? So this is in essence the idea that in order to make money, you got to spend some, okay? So I take my ATP that I've used, this drives this reaction, and I can make four, leaving me with a net ATP production of two ATP molecules only. Um, so I made four, but I had to spend two in order to do it. So I only net two ATP molecules. My pyruvates um, are then okay, going to be going through a process where I'm going to break off a carbon molecule, carbon dioxide, gets kicked off, leaving me with a single, or two really, but a two carbon molecule, okay, which is acetaldehyde, which then 
takes the electrons from NADH and that, um, if I remove the electrons, right, um, then I'm going to oxidize the NADH and I'm going to create ethanol, okay, so, which is my two carbon, and there's your alcohol right there, okay. Now, this is something, like I said, single-celled critters can do this in the absence of oxygen. Yeast are capable of doing this, your bacteria. Um, and this is just a non-oxygen way of building ATP. Not really effective for us. We can't do it a lot because we wouldn't make enough ATP to, to survive. All right. So just a little reminder. I know I went through and explained it. Pyruvate. Okay, that is what gets made after we break glucose, okay? So my pyruvate right here, okay? Acetaldehyde is the product of it, converted ultimately into ethanol, and we have released, we have released, oops, sorry. And we have released CO2. Okay, so, all right. Now, alcohol. Buildup of excessive alcohol would be a toxin, okay? So, if you had an organism that got stuck like yeast cells, let's say, um, in, a, in a situation where there was no oxygen and they had to do this to survive, alcohol would build up, build up, build up, right? But it's a toxin, so eventually that buildup of the ethanol is going to kill them. Um, so it's a temporary solution not having oxygen or there needs to be a way to remove the excess ethanol. Another form of fermentation is called lactate formation. And this is something that ha can happen to us um, if we're over, you know, you're working really hard, you work out, work out, work out, and you are requiring more ATP than, and you're using up all the available oxygen. And so you don't have any more. So your body will go into what we call lactic acid ferment, you know, lactic acid formation, and what is ultimately lactate fermentation. It's gonna start out with glycolysis again. We're gonna take our glucose molecule, break it apart into our pyruvates. Same deal in, as in the alcohol fermentation. We're gonna take our two ATPs, use them, and this happens in aerobic respiration too, this first step glycolysis. We bust glucose down into pyruvate, we burn two ATPs, we make four, we net two. Now the pyruvate, okay, same, everything up here is the same. The pyruvate then is converted down using um, and, and reducing once the NADH has been reduced, comes down, donates those electrons, and we create and convert the pyruvate into lactate, okay? And this can build up in the system, and if you've ever done any sustained huge amounts of exercise and you cramp up and your muscles feel like they're gonna seize, it's because they're being, you know, there's tons of lactic acid that's coming out because you've just, you've reached it, you've gone, what we call, we say you've gone anaerobic. Um, you've utilized all the possible oxygen that you have. So this really low ATP yield is good if it's a small inactive creatures. Um, if you're an itty bitty thing, you don't move a lot, this will work. Or your body says, look, this is going to be a quick fix. This is going to be something to just, you know, tide you over, but stop what you're doing because this isn't going to work for a long time. So once we do that, then, you know, hopefully the body, you know, stops, kind of reboots, start bringing in extra oxygen, and it switches back over. All right, so in bacteria, there is a form of electron transport that happens. Electrons get basically stripped off of their substrate molecules, okay? So we're gonna kind of steal them away. And again, this is our chaos. So here's my ancient bacteria, right? Um, they're gonna strip them away from the substrate molecules, okay? And then these molecules are going to move through in essence, an ETS, okay? So we aren't gaining these electrons from 
tons of cofactors like we would in um, aerobic respiration, um, but they're stripping them from the substrate, what they're breaking down, basically, like glucose or some form of sugar, um, and they move them through an ETS ultimately to generate ATP, their version of their energy, right? And something like those bacteria that live in those crazy hot springs, um, they can actually do this from inorganic compounds like sulfurs and nitrates and use those, okay, instead of oxygens, use those as the final electron acceptors to basically grab all of those electrons that have been moving through the chain to help build ATP. So there's no need for the oxygen and they can survive in these crazy extreme environments and um, you know there are some theories out there that say hey this is how life sort of began before oxygen really began to build up in the planet we had critters that could actually um, utilize these inorganic compounds to act as electron acceptors to help build up their ATP so I think we're going to so I think we're going to leave it here and next we'll be traveling into the world of aerobic respiration and but just to give you a taste of what happens um, this is going to set the stage for us it's going to set the stage for our lab um, and everything so hope you guys have a great night and we'll catch you in class later